Well, it's a couple of minutes after. Uh, are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Johnson. Uh, my company is Logical Helion LLC. And uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, writing distributed processing applications with Helios. Uh, now, Helios is an application that, well, actually, it's an application framework that um, I wrote a couple years ago. Uh, I was working at a working at a place, and we had two specific problems that we needed to solve. Uh, the biggest thing was that we had to have a way to hand off long-running processes uh, from our website because there were things that were actually. Can you guys hear me? Okay, or do I need to? Okay. Um, we uh, we needed a way to ha hand off things from our web server uh, because there were things that we needed to do that were just taking too long, and uh, users were getting timeouts. Uh, this this company uh, had a website that has a social networking component, so one of the things you could do would send, send messages, uh, except that the the network grew so big that if you tried to actually send a message to a lot of people. It, you would time out waiting for the broadcast to get done because it was doing a lot of complicated database work on the back end, stuff that the database just couldn't handle uh, fast It couldn't do it fast enough. Uh, also, along the same lines, there were a lot of things that needed to happen in the background, uh, nightly batch processing, but also uh, updates uh, throughout the day as uh, new, new information came in. People would have blog posts. Uh, people would post in message groups, things like that. But, um, for example, the search engine needed to be updated every so often. Uh, the search engine they had before we came up with the solution, uh, actually, they couldn't rebuild the database. Uh, sorry, couldn't rebuild the search index, and updating the index took two weeks to do. So the search index they had was... Suboptimal, <laughs> we'll say. But uh, so there was a decision made in particular with that case to upgrade to a solar index, and there were some other things that were uh, decisions that were made. But those new the new infrastructure required some kind of way to manage all of this back end stuff that needed to happen. And uh, at the time, there weren't. Right now, there's a lot of different ways to do this kind of thing. But at the time, there weren't nearly as many, and most of them weren't particularly uh, robust at that point. I mean, this has been a couple of years. There's been a lot of changes. A lot of different things have matured. So, you know, there's more options now. But, um, but I like this option, uh, which we decided to call Helios. <clears throat> and actually, if you look, you catch that it was originally designed to, index, to manage solar indexes, so Helios, so... Sorry if you don't know your Greek gods. That's <laughs> that's okay. Anyway, uh, Helios, uh, the goal was to provide a way to distribute the load of massive amounts of work across multiple hosts but still retain a central command and control uh, option. And uh, ultimately, it uses a collective database to hold, hold the configuration information and the job queuing uh, and also the default logging. Um, and then using a standard Unix process model, uh, basically you can use Unix processes and forking and things like that to manage the work coordination and task isolation. One of the goals was, so you have a task, uh, something happens to that, but you've got thousands, tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of other tasks happening. You don't want that one failure to cause problems with any of the others which is why the Unix process model actually works really well in this case because that way things are isolated. Something happens to one, you can throw an exception or handle that. At the same time, you've still got hundreds of others going on their merry way. So the Helios architecture, as I mentioned, has a central collective database uh, that houses the daemon configuration information, the job queue information, and the default logging uh, information. Um, jobs are submitted uh, basically three ways, through HTTP, and there's a shell script, and of course you can use the Perl API. I'll show you guys the Perl API today, um, but a lot of times, depending on what you're doing, uh, you can 
you know, especially, especially a lot of people that are doing a lot of uh, big database work, a lot of times they just need to kick off something. You can, you, you can just use, like, kick off something from a shell command or a cron or something. You can just, that way you can just use from the shell. You don't have to write a special Perl routine just to get things going. Um, or you can launch a job through HTTP as well. So you don't have to write a, some bit of Perl uh, in order to get things running. Uh, as I mentioned, I've already mentioned daemons. The Helios service daemons act as agents uh, for your application. Jobs come in. The service daemons see those and launch worker processes. Those worker processes uh, start up, start pulling jobs out of the job queue, and then calling uh, a run method in, in your Helios service to perform the jobs. Now, as I've already started to mention here, in Helios architecture, there's two basic uh, concepts. There's a concept of services, which is the core of your Helios application. It's just a subclass of Helios service. Uh, there's a run method that you implement. That's the main method uh, that directs the processing in, in your application. Uh, all the processing logic either is in the subclass or can be called from the subclass. So obviously, if you've got you know, a huge library of other routines you want to run, you know, you don't have to, they don't have to be in the subclass. You can just use that module and then make your calls as necessary. Um, when your run method is done, when your job is done, uh, it's the service marks that job as completed or failed. Now, jobs are just arguments in uh, Helios. A job is just a representation of work. Um, that's you know, you know, a task, a, a single task, or you know, just a single, well, like I said, a single unit of work. Uh, these are specified via XML. Um, well, although it cheats a lot, it's more XML-like. Um, it's not like we're validating against a DDT or anything. That that kind of stuff takes too long. <laughs> um, and like I said, jobs are arguments only. That's kind of one of the. Uh, differences about Helios as opposed to some other systems that were around at the time. Um, jobs aren't code. Jobs are just arguments to services. The code is in the service. And that's, so jobs, that way jobs can be really simple and relatively easy to manage because they're just arguments. All your code is in the service. Uh, there's a couple other slightly more advanced concepts I'll just mention in passing. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, there, there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot more to Helios than just these things, but uh, we don't have all afternoon. <laughs> so, uh, so this is this talk is a bit more cut down from uh, from a previous talk I did. So, I just so I'm I'm going to gloss over some things. If you do have questions or whatever, just yeah, you know, feel free to ask. Or you know, hopefully we'll have time at the end. Uh, and uh, or you can if we don't have time uh, you can ask me later I'm more than happy to talk all day <laughs> so um, anyway a couple more advanced concepts is concept of collective which I'm already starting to mention basically a collective is all of the Helios service daemons that are running and the database that they're connected to and uh, and these are managed by Helios Panoptes which is the web interface uh, Basically, as I said, it was the command and control center. Um, you can uh, view logs there, watch jobs come through, view the view the internal log system, uh, shut down processes, that kind of thing. So Helios has three different uh, basic subsystems. We have job queuing, application configuration, and logging. And as I mentioned already, to create a Helios application, your basic, your first step is to create a subclass of Helios service and then implement a run method. And then what will happen is the, the Helios worker daemon that's, are, that's loaded your service, when it pulls the job from the queue, will actually pass that queue to the run method. Actually, I should. Um, this looked a little small on the screen, so I'm going to switch over to... Text me. Here we go. Yeah. Now I'm going to show you a, a basic Helios service. This is actually in the Helios distribution as an example. Uh, it's just a simple thing that extracts the the ID three tags from an MP three 
and stores that information in a database. Um, and I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of extracting ID3 tags. Uh, that That's just a module I downloaded on CPAN. <laughs> but... Um, but uh, what will? But but the thing it is though is that this does implement the run method, and you can see how basically all Helio stuff gets started. So um, yeah, we might as well start at the top there. The of course we're declaring a package, um, and we're using basic uh, stuff that you do in Perl when you're creating Perl classes. Um, we're inheriting. Here's my pointer. Here's my pointer. Uh, we're inheriting from Helio service, doing a use base. Um, now, a couple of things here that are Helio specific. We're actually pulling in the Helios error modules, which are some exception classes that Helios defines. Certain Helios methods uh, do throw exceptions, and uh, so it's important to try to catch those. Now, depending on what you're doing, you don't necessarily have to do anything in particular with those. Uh, and in writing your own application, you don't have to use these. You can do, use your own or whatever you want to do. There, there just are some built-in one exceptions here for you to use if you want to. Uh, we're also pulling in uh, Helios log entry levels, which is just some constants that help us with logging. Uh, that way we can type log info for an info message or log alert if there's a major problem uh, instead of typing in numbers because nobody remembers numbers. So so that's just some constants to help with logging. And like I said, MP3 info is just something I downloaded off CPAN. It's there for everybody. Um, and then here's our run method. And I, there, there's a couple other methods in this class. And like I said, this is in the Helios distribution if you really want to see what they do. I'm just going to concentrate on the run method because this is what's, in, this is what's important to all Helios applications. Um, there's a run method. This is a pretty standard instance method in a class. Uh, you grab, you grab yourself. The only thing that you grab yourself, actually. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, the only thing that's passed to the run method is a job object, uh, which we're getting there. Uh, pulling, we'll pull in the configuration by calling the get config method. And then we'll parse the job arguments into a hash ref by calling the get job args method. Now, just so you know, this, this service only actually has one argument. Uh, it's a file name. So just for syntax purposes, this is actually grabbing the file name and putting it in the file name scaler there. <clears throat> and then what we're doing here is this is just straight up Perl. This is an eval uh, to do try catch type things. Uh, you can use try tiny. I've used it. Uh, it works generally well. Um, you could use exception class. Uh, it has a try catch in it. I, you can use that too. Uh, I'm just using straight Perl to just try to try to limit the dependencies. Just so you know, you know, if you have Perl and a few modules, you should be able to do this. You don't need you don't need to use try tiny or try catch or anything like that. Though if you can, if you want to, you can. Um, first thing you see here is the log message uh, method. That's how you write to the logs. I'll explain a little bit more in detail there uh, in a little bit. <clears throat> but as you see, uh, here's, a, here's a constant log info. This is just a normal informational message. We got that from uh, log entry levels up at the top. Um, one thing here, we are actually throwing one of the Helios errors here. Um, if you can't read, if we can't read the file name, the file that's specified, then obviously you're not going to be able to parse the MP3 tags out of it. So it's throwing a Helios uh, exception here. Like I said, you don't have to use these. You can have your own, or you don't even really have to throw errors if you don't want to. It, that's really up to you. Um, let's see what else do we have here. We're parsing the MP, MP3 info. Here's another log message. Um, now, there is a concept of debug mode. You can run your service daemons in debug mode. If you do that, uh, the daemon won't disconnect from the terminal. So you can do things like this. Uh, if we're in debug mode, actually, we're going to dump the data structure that we got back from that MP3 parse algorithm. And uh, that, that can help ease your, ease your debugging if, say, for example, 
something is going wrong, but you know this thing is running over here, and as a daemon, it's hard to get to what's really going on. You can try to log it and things like, but then that becomes cumbersome. So you can switch things over to debug mode, and then you have access to the. It, it doesn't disconnect from the console, so you can watch debug messages come come by, and you can do things like this: dump your whole data structure out, and then look at it. Um, here's another MP3 only method. Here we're updating the database, and then. Once that's done, the job is complete. And so th this is what happened. When the job is complete, then uh, what you need to do is call the complete job method if it completed successfully. Now, if something did go wrong, uh, like this error was thrown or something did happen somewhere else, um, I've got an eval and a do eval or do block here. Like I said, this is pretty simple. You can do try tiny or whatever you want here to capture exceptions. I'm just doing the basic thing here. Uh, we're grabbing dollar at and we're stringifying it and logging that uh, string as an error. And then we're marking the job as failed because it's because it's failed. Uh, failed a failure and succession of jobs will be logged in the job history in the collective database, and you'll be able to see that from. You'll, you'll be able to see that from the Panopti's uh, web uh, console, or you could actually use SQL commands to query the database and find out yourself. Depends on how much you want to extend the system. You can use the basic system. It works fine uh, but for, for, for a lot of different things, but if you need more things, the database is there for you to query things. Like if you wanted to do reports or something, um, for example, I've written uh, some applications for some clients before that, um, you know, they needed to see the statistics, like what, you know, how many jobs were performed in the past 24 hours, how many failed, how many succeeded. You can use, everything's in the database. You can write a report on that. <coughs> yeah. That's available. All right, like I said, there's some other methods here, but these are specific to MP3 uh, parsing, so I'm not going to really get into that. Um, how are we doing on time? 50, oh, okay. Um, let's see. Next slide. Yeah, okay. Now, that's how you process jobs. How do you actually get them in the system? Uh, let me switch back over here. And this is actually also in the distribution, that I, in the Helios distribution. Um, this is just the little shell script that... Um, Basically, you just pass it in file names, and uh, it submits jobs to Helios to get the MP3s indexed. Um, first thing you have to do is uh, set up the service and get the configuration. This is pretty easy. Basically, I'll explain a little bit about the configuration system later. But uh, once you've got the configuration, then uh, then this is just a while loop. You know, while there's still file names being submitted, um, this is creating XML. It's creating a new uh, Helios job object, uh, passing it the configuration from the service. Uh, set func name, what that does is it tells Helios that, yeah, this job needs to be processed by this service. So in effect, even though there's actually one job table in the database, there's actually multiple queues in that table, uh, one for each service. And then we're passing it the argument XML and then submitting the job. And like I said, there's a shell script. If you know you're into shell scripts, uh, where you don't have to create Perl stubs or things like that, you can just call the shell script. And there's a there's a CGI in there too. Uh, if you uh, want to submit things over HTTP. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the different uh, subsystems a little more. Like I said, about jobs, uh, your run method is going to receive a Helios job object. You use the get jobs, the get job args method to parse the job, job arguments into a hash ref. And then once your job is complete, you mark it as completed job if it completed or failed job if it failed. Uh, now, the configuration subsystem is, is a little different than some people expect because people see configuration and they just think, oh, that configures the Helios service. But it also configures your application as well. Uh, effectively, what happens, there's an INI file that, uh, that you, you set an environment variable to point it to where that is. And when service daemon starts up, uh, the, the INI file will have 
the information, the DSN user password to connect to the collective database. And then once, once it's connected, then all the other system configuration and, and your application uh, is in the database table in the collective database. And you, you can use SQL commands to update uh, the configuration, or you can use the web interface. And uh, then as far as your service goes, to get your configuration, all you do is call the get config method, and you'll get a hash ref with all of your application's configuration. So if you've got two applications, like say you've got your MP3 index service, and then you've got something to send out an email or something, uh, those two don't necessarily share the same configuration. You can have that if you want. There is a global section that you can set global options if you want, but, uh, but it's generally geared toward you know, each service has its own configuration. And then the logging subsystem, this is something that's actually somewhat new in the latest Helios. Uh, you saw the log message uh, method. But uh, and, and normally, by default, that does write to the Helios database, and that's just a table that you can use SQL to query, or you can view it on the, the admin console. But uh, the, the logging interface is actually modularized. You don't have to use the internal Helios log. You can use syslog, you can use log for Perl. Those are out there on CPAN. Uh, you can use something else. Uh, there's a Helios logger interface that uh, you can use. There's just there's two methods that you have to implement: one to initiate your, uh, I said initiate initialize, I guess really your uh, your logging system, and then a, a log message method to that'll actually be called to write to whatever your log system is. So it's actually pretty easy. So if you wanted to write something for say like Nagios or Splunk, uh, you could do that. Although, actually, when I, I did some stuff with Splunk and actually used log for Perl, so, you know, <laughs> depending on how you want to do that, you can. But the point is, is that's open. Um, and, and like I said, if you wanted to only use syslog, uh, you can do that. You can turn off the internal uh, logger, or you can use combinations. Uh, for example, if, say, you wanted to retain the information in the Helios log so you could, you know, do searches on it, or that kind of thing, but you had an external monitoring tool that monitored syslog, you could set it up to where your log system, uh, your Helios log system logs all of your information, but then things of a certain severity, like alerts, or you could even throw an emergency or something, uh, would go to syslog, and then your external monitoring tool would see in syslog, oh, there's an alert. I need to page someone about that. Uh, there's two basic design patterns to Helios applications so far. You saw MP3 indexer service. That's pretty simple. And, you know, that's a lot of things you can just do that way. You know, put some things in a class, you know, off you go. Uh, more complex apps, uh, sometimes it helps to actually have them be dual lived, where you can basically develop your app somewhat independent of Helios and then have your run method act as a main method to call the functions in to call the functions in your application and then you'd have another uh, you'd have another method that runs outside of Helios where you could run things like from a command line uh, sometimes that helps testing I've noticed um, in developing some of these applications because sometimes it's kind of because when these things run, they're running from a service daemon. Uh, you know, they're not connected to things like standard out or, or standard in, standard out, standard error. So it's sometimes it's, when you're really getting into things, sometimes it's hard to debug things. If, when you have a really complex application, if you do this this way, you do basically have two main methods that start things off, but that way you can, you see something is a problem, you can go to the command line, run it manually, see what's happening there. Um, of course, in that case, you can also run in debug mode. Uh, it just depends on what you want to do. Like I said, if you're, for your simple applications, that's not usually something that you do, but you know these things can get pretty complicated. Um, so there is that option. The basic idea is you know, to, to start things with Helios, you start off just subclassing Helios service put stuff in the run method, and you know, whatever you put in the run method is really up to you. 
Now, as far as recommendations for, you know, you've decided you want to try this out, you want to get your get the most performance possible out of this. Uh, two factors are will come into play. One is what your applications are actually doing, and then the other is database capacity. And uh, the what your applications are doing is kind of an interesting thing because a lot of people I've talked to sometimes say, "Oh, well, I can run my I can run my thing faster this way." Well, it dep you can run more of them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to run them faster. You know, if you have a thousand things to do, but each of them take five seconds, you know, you can run forty of them at a time, but then but they're all still going to take five seconds. <laughs> you know, so so you are bound by what you can do. Uh, for example, if you um, have a file transfer that you need, to, you, you want to transfer like all these files, and you want to do it all at once. But if each file transfer takes thirty seconds, you know, it's going to take thirty seconds for each job to do that, you know, and you'll be able to do more of them at a time, so you will get done faster, but, you know, you still do have, you know, there, there still is a certain thing there where you, you're not going to get faster than what its, what its theoretical limit is going to do. The other thing, as far as Helios is actually concerned, is database capacity. As I mentioned, the, the job queuing, the logging, and uh, the configuration is all in a database. Uh, obviously, Helios can work faster than if it has a larger database. Uh, MySQL, uh, you can do a lot of interesting things with MySQL. Uh, so my, I've seen MySQL scale much higher than I thought it would, actually. Um, when the, where the company I worked for when we originally wrote this um, had a relatively beefy MySQL server, but it wasn't really... You know, there weren't wasn't that much involved in like tuning. We didn't have like the cluster stuff. You know, it, it wasn't like it was it was nice, but it wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Um, and they were able to do. You know, I think last time I talked to them, you know, they were doing something like millions of jobs a day. So you know, of course, and of course, a lot of that was bound by what they were doing. You know, sending mail takes time. You know, uh, tr file transfers. You know, they take time. You know. Um, one thing that's new, that's pretty much brand new, is Oracle official Oracle support. Um, I do have some things running on Oracle Rack. Uh, it is actually impressive how far Oracle can actually scale with Rack. Uh, I point out this is still kind of beta, mostly because the web admin interface Panoptes actually hasn't been updated for Oracle yet. Only the the core, uh, only the core Helios. Uh, is running on Oracle right now. So requirements to get this thing running if you want to try it out. Uh, basically, any any Unix OS that's running Perl ought to be able to work. Uh, as I mentioned, MySQL uh, or, or Oracle. And uh, you'll need a CGI web server if you want to submit jobs to HTTP uh, or, or use the admin interface. Um, I'm going to go ahead and list a couple of major CPAN modules here because sometimes people have installed, tried, you know, I'm sure actually we've all ran into this where, oh, look, I want to, I want to use this. And then you go to the CPAN um, command line and you type install something. And then there's 10,000 things that, uh, that get downloaded and run. And then, you know, number 500 something dies. And it's like, oh, no, now I have to get, I'm just warning you that, you know, these things, uh, are here. Uh, th I, there are pretty extensive install instructions in the distribution, but just fair warning, uh, data object driver and the Schwartz uh, we're relying on to do some job queuing and some database work. Uh, XML simple is doing the XML parsing. Uh, there's config I and I files there. I point that out. That is not supposed to be a particularly annoying module, but it has been on Perl 5.8 lately because it wants to, it wants to install a bunch of stuff it didn't used to do. <laughs> but uh, So I'm just pointing that out if you are actually going to run it on 5.8. Um, and then the error module, um, error simple is used as the base, uh, base exception class for the Helios classes. And I'm pointing that out because uh, the error module got a lot of flack uh, for its try-catch methods. And, uh, and, you know, that... That's that was warranted because you know you 
effectively you could accidentally create closures. So, <laughs> so that's bad. But uh, error simple is a simple base class for exceptions that is in there that doesn't do crazy things at a glance. So, uh, so we're still actually using error simple as a base class, but for the exceptions, we're not using the try catch things that are in there because that was that ended up, ends up creating some problems. Um, having said that, though, as I mentioned, you don't have to use that if you want to have exception class or something else as your as your exceptions. That's fine. Um, Actually, apparently, a talk that was parallel to this one was about about a new exception uh, system. So, uh, so I'm sorry you guys missed that, but I'm glad you came here anyway. <laughs> uh, so, future roadmap: wh where things are kind of going with Helios. Uh, as I mentioned, things are somewhat database bound now, and uh, one of the things is really want to start trying to modularize Helios more simply because a lot of people don't have that database infrastructure uh, built to be able to take advantage of this. So one of the things is to modularize the job queue so you can use things like RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ. Um, eventually like to provide uh, Java argument support in JSON So because a lot of people do have JavaScript uh, they, and they want to, rather, rather than go through a CGI, they'd like to be able to just use JavaScript and submit jobs or submit jobs from Python or something else. Uh, uh, you could also do complex job arguments there too, which is something that the way that uh, Helios is using XML simple right now, it's really not geared for doing complex data structures right now, at least not. You could do it, but that's the thing. You'd have to sort of grab the job XML from your from your job object that that you were passed and do special things to it. You couldn't just use get job args and get your complex data structure back. So I'd like to uh, add JSON support for that. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, the error module is a little out of favor now, so I eventually I'd like to move to exception class. Although, as I said, noth nothing... No, none of this is actually preventing you from doing using your own exceptions. You know, it seems like Perl. <laughs> it, it, not only is there more than one way to do it, there's there's definitely more than one way to throw an exception and catch it. So, <laughs> so just because Helios is using Error Simple doesn't mean you have to. And like I said, ultimately, what I'd like to do uh, the logging system, modularizing the log logging system, has really uh, opened up some opportunities. Uh, for certain clients and uh, and some other people, just that flexibility, and uh, I really see that uh, increasing the modularity, uh, I think, would really increase the niche that Helios can service. So, uh, as far as if you so you heard all that and you're still interested, uh, Helios is on CPAN, uh, and the Panopti's web interface is uh, packaged separately, but it's also there, as well as uh, the uh, two logger classes uh, for syslog and log for Perl are there too. Um, like I said, you could use whatever logging system you wanted. Uh, syslog and log for Perl seem like fairly popular ones, but it's relatively easy to write your own. Uh, I'm LAJ Andy on CPAN, and uh, you could contact me through my CPAN address if you have any questions or any ideas. Uh, uh, any patches uh, are also welcome. And then, uh, as I mentioned, my company, uh, new company, so it's still a bit rough around the edges as far as website and things like that, is uh, logicalhelion.com, and uh, it's also logicalhelion on Twitter. So, um, questions? Anybody? Comments? Snores. <laughs> um, yeah, the question was, have we thought about, uh, what's his name? I, okay. Okay. Um, well, that is one of the things with the modularity. Uh, if we open 
things to the point to where you could pretty much just use whatever job queue you wanted, then you could use that one. Or I mentioned RabbitMQ because that's a really popular queuing system right now. Uh, the Ruby people especially are using it a lot, and so that seemed to be a good target, uh, initial target. But, uh, but yeah, pretty much the idea would be to make, like the logging system, logging, the logging API is generic enough that you can pretty much put just about any logging system in there, really. Uh, same thing. Uh, what The goal really is to uh, make the interface generic enough that whatever queuing system you want to put in should work fine. For example, one thing I noticed uh, this past week is, uh, what's the name of it? Directory queue is on CPAN. And uh, that it actually uses the file system as a queuing interface. Uh, the, the, at first, you kind of think, oh, well, that seems awfully simple. But then that, but that's the thing, though. It's awfully simple. That's a great first step to get you started. You know, and then if you go beyond that, then, yeah, you can replace that with RabbitMQ or something like that. So the goal really is to be able to write your Helios application and then, and then be able to change the queuing system, the logging system, whatever, underneath and not have to change your application because everything, because Helios will handle all the job stuff for you, all the queuing or whatever, and then, you know, you don't have to worry about that in your application because your application just calls the Helios APIs, and Helios is handling that under the hood. So, so I didn't see his talk, but, uh, uh, but actually I'm interested now. I'm going to have to go back and check his, check his video. Anybody else? Is there a on the job for like a job yes. Yes, actually there is. And that was one of the things that I had to cut out because uh, last time my <laughs> last time I talk, my 50-minute talk was about an hour and a half. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, yes, there's an API that you can do. See, the, the Schwartz actually handles that uh underneath, but there's a few things that it doesn't do quite like Helios wants, so Helios kind of has a bit of a shim API over it, but, uh, and, and, and there's a few changes, well, not changes, but enhancements I want to make uh, soon to that. But yes, uh, in your service class, there are two methods you can define, uh, a max retries and a retry interval. Uh, method, and if you do that, then that sets how many times a job is retried if it failed, or and, and the interval of that, uh, how many times, the interval between retries. Um, now, like I said, right now, Schwartz is actually locking the retry interval to, to a minimum of 60 minutes, which is weird, and hopefully Helios in the near future is going to change. I, I have something uh, I'm testing now to change that to where if you want to retry every minute, then you can do that. Uh, it's just it's one of those things that you have to be careful about to make sure that things work all right. Um, I should note, note, note too, in addition to the fail job method, there's also a fail job permanent method. If, for example, your code through an exception that you, for some reason, you decided, no, I don't want this. I, don't even try. Just stop. Uh, so, yeah, you could, if you threw that exception or for some reason just decided, no, we're stopping with this altogether, do not retry, you can call that method and the job will be permanently failed and it won't appear in the queue again. Sort of going along no. with that, what happens if a job never returns? Never returns? Yeah. What do you mean? Ah, well, okay, so, oh, I actually, have, I just realized I, I haven't been repeating the questions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the question was, what happens if uh, a job is submitted, uh, a, a service picks it up, a uh, worker process picks it up to do it, and then crashes for some reason? Okay, well, uh, one of the new things in uh, Helios 2.4, actually, is uh, there's actually extra error trapping that happens. So if, for some reason, your code dies of an uncaught exception, Helios, by default, will capture that and log that and automatically fail the job and log that as an uncaught exception. 
that you should probably fix. <laughs> but uh, so so there is that uh, extra error trapping that's there now that wasn't there in the previous versions. Uh, you can you actually there's a an, uh, there's a configuration option to turn it off if for some reason that's complicating your stack too much or something. But uh, if that were to happen, uh, the way Helios the way Helios works, when the worker process gets the job, it's actually locked in the database for a certain amount of time. If that job isn't marked as succeeded or failed after, uh, for that amount of time, after that, uh, the other service daemons and worker processes see that job as fair game. And so after that time has expired, uh, another worker process will pick that up. And, um, but of course, that's part of the thing Helios tries its best to prevent that kind of thing from happening, but uh, or at least now it does anyway. But uh, but if it does for some reason, uh, yeah, another service would pick it up eventually, and a worker process would pull it from the queue. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, so the question was, uh, what happens if a worker process uh, picks up a job and then gets stuck in what appears to be an endless loop, uh, never marks the job as failed or succeeded, and then other processes also come along and pick up that process and also get stuck in an endless loop? Well, yes, that, that is something that can happen. Um, basically, after the... Uh, after the job lock interval has expired, basically when worker processes pick up a job, they are locked for a certain amount of time. The default is an hour, I think. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the code now, but I believe the, the um, wait, what time is it? Okay, we have, a, we have a little bit of time, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, when, when a worker process picks up a job, it is locked for a certain amount of time. And like I said, I believe it's an, I believe it's an hour right now by default. Uh, so what happens, it gets stuck in, the process gets stuck in an endless loop. So then that hour expires, that process is still working there, and then another process comes along and picks it up. Also gets stuck in an endless loop. Okay, yes, that's a problem. Um, <laughs> and uh, one way that you can deal with that is there is a configuration option for Helios processes called, um, wait, is it worker max TTL or is it max work? Worker max TTL that uh, after a certain amount of time, if a Helios process has gone a certain amount of time, it, basically what you do, you set a worker max TTL for a certain number of seconds. Uh, if a worker process runs beyond that certain amount of seconds, Helios actually kills that process. So, so that doesn't necessarily solve your problem, but it does prevent things like that from spinning out of control to where suddenly you know, all of your worker processes are all stuck trying to do the same job and the queue is backing up because there's no longer any processes available. That's, yeah, so you can set uh, the worker max TTL to forcibly kill off processes that uh, go, go for too long because a normally working process actually checks that every so often to make sure that it's not uh, it, it's not been running too long. And if it goes past that, uh, that option, I'm sorry, it goes past that number of seconds, it'll shut, shut itself down. So the Helios service daemon is watching the processes. If it sees that a process has gone on for too long and hasn't shut itself down, it has to assume that something like that has happened, that there's an endless loop, and it kills it. All right. Um, any other questions? I, we may. Looks like we're starting to get some people in for the next presentation. Um, anybody else? Okay. Good. Well, I'm here till uh, till Saturday anyway. Uh, I go on at length as many people will tell you <laughs> about Helios and other things. So uh, I am more than willing to talk to you guys, uh, especially if you have like an app in mind that you think you'd. Uh, think Helios might be good for. I'd love to talk to you about it. So, so thank you for your time. I appreciate it.